brave young man named Stanley Barrett, the first human being to surpass the speed of sound on the surface of the earth. Who is Stan Barrett? As a Hollywood stuntman, on one day he is set on fire, on the next he may be blown up. He's been Paul Newman's stuntman and compatriot for some ten years. He's an enigma. He is on one hand, uh the most devout family man, uh, very tender and very loving. And on the other hand, he's got two black belts in karate. He's Golden Gloves champion, great motocross rider and motorcycle. So how you balance that off, I really don't know, because he runs the entire spectrum. He really does. I've been a stuntman for 14 years now, and I've done a lot of things that probably seemed uh, to other people really crazy. I'm as prepared to die as I am to live. I got a call from my answering service saying that Paul Newman's office wanted to talk to me. And they said, you know, Paul would like you to come up and double him on this film. Met Paul, didn't have a lot to say to him except, hey, don't start my bike. It will break your leg if it kicks back on you. He tries to start my bike and breaks his ankle. <laughs> That started our friendship. <laughs> he respected so much what I did, and each time I'd get in that car, you know, part of him was going to be in the car with me. He told me one time, he said, hey, don't break my watches. In other words, be careful out there. Here we go, Stan. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, superstitious at all but I loved those watches and what they stood for and Paul had given them to me so of all the things I had those watches were probably the most treasured. Welcome to the Jake E Show. I'm your host Jake Ehrlich and today I have Stan Barrett with me. How you doing Stan? Good. How you doing Jake? Great. Um, so this is very exciting because uh, you are auctioning off three of your famous Rolex watches uh, coming up with Sotheby's on the 9th in New York City. Of course, these are these are no ordinary Rolex watches. They're very special uh, because uh, two of them were gifts from one of your best friends, your good friend, Paul Newman. And then the other one, wasn't that a gift from uh, uh, Budweiser? That was from August Bush, yeah, of Budweiser. And he was, uh, was he the CEO at the time? Yeah. So, um, as we just learned in the intro, you set the, uh, you, you were the first human being to drive on land and break the speed of sound record back in 1979, uh, which is an amazing feat. Um, and of course, you were wearing your two Rolex watches. Uh, that Paul gave you at the time. Tell tell us what you're going to do with the uh, the proceeds. Are I think you mentioned you're going to be donating to a bunch of different organizations. Is that right? Yeah, but I, you know, I told Rolex. I mean, I told Sotheby's. I wouldn't really discuss that. You know, um, a certain amount of it's going to charities, but I'm not um, at liberty to talk about that. I mean, I've supported, you know soldiers and you know, wounded warriors and so on for many years and you know i've done a lot of work in ukraine and belarus with the things that paul Newman and i started so we'll see you know a lot depends on how much money i get uh from this auction i remember uh we've known each other for years and i wrote uh, a super detailed article about your amazing career achievements 
And uh, in that, um, uh, I covered your uh, the projects you worked on in Ukraine. And at the time, I wasn't that familiar with Ukraine and what was going on, but it it seems to be really relevant today. Can you share a little bit with us about how you got involved in your camp in Ukraine? Well, that goes back 20 some years. Um, you know, um, I made my first trip to uh, uh, Ukraine and to Russia actually in 1988 and uh, visited Chernobyl and uh, was amazed at um, the need there, you know, and especially among the children as they're more affected by radiation than adults are. So, you know, Paul and I uh, started a project at the hospital in Ukraine, the children's hospital, and then it was expanded to a camp in Belarus for those kids, kind of a um, get away from the radiation zones. And so Paul set up the camp for you. Is that correct? No, he contributed to it. You know, Slavic Gospel was uh, the reason I got involved with a camp that had been there, but, you know, needed a lot of help. So anyhow, uh, they were the ones that took me there and showed me what the need was. And, you know, once you see the need, then you... Uh, can choose whether to get involved or not, you know, and it's kind of overwhelming the need there. And what's, what's the name of the camp? Uh, camp Pearl, which I've never liked, but I mean, that's not the Russian name, but that's how it translates. But it was the same area that the movie Defiance was about um, in World War II, where the uh, Jewish brothers, three of them hid all the um, uh, Jewish people uh, from the Nazis. But that's one of the only radiation-free zones in Belarus. And uh, so you were also um, Paul Newman's stunt double throughout his career. How did you first meet Paul? <laughs> that's kind of a strange story i was under contract to burt reynolds on a series called dan august and i got a call from my answer service saying that paul newman's uh, office wanted to talk to me so i you know that was the days before cell phones so i finally uh contacted them and they said paul would like you to come up and double him on a film in oregon and so i said i'm sorry i can't uh, I'm under contract to Bert uh, on this production. And I said, although I'm a super fan of Paul Newman's, I said, I can't do this. And so shortly thereafter, uh, Bert comes over to me and says, you dummy, I want to meet Paul Newman. Go up there. <laughs> and I said, OK, but, uh, you know, you got to put Hal Needham in my place, who was my mentor as a stunt man. And. He had doubled Bert before I started doubling him. And uh, I said, take me off salary and I'll I'll go. So I drove up to my home in Bishop, you know, four hours away and loaded my bikes up because it was motorcycle stunts and drove all night to Oregon. And uh, I first met Paul, you know, that next day. And, and you know, he... Our the stunt coordinator on the show said, show Paul what you can do. And I said, you know, it's like auditioning. I don't like that stuff. But anyhow, I un unloaded my bike and I wheelied down the road and back up. And, you know, Paul was impressed. And But he asked me to go to dinner. And uh, his brother, Arthur, was a production manager on the show. And um, he was a big fan of my ex-wife, who was a skier. And her father owned Mammoth Mountain. And so he had asked us to go. So we went with him. And I told Paul, I said, do not start my bike because um, it's a factory uh, Husqvarna. And it is, has so much compression that 
if you screw up, it'll break your leg when you start it. And so anyhow, he didn't listen to that. I was in the hospital uh, getting injections into a disc I ruptured my back. And he starts it and breaks his ankle. So they shut down the film and I go home. And so I was doing some big stunts for Bert and so on. And then I tore my knee on uh, practicing on my motocross bike. And anyhow, I get a call from my mother-in-law. She says, Paul Newman's trying to get a hold of you. So I call his office and Maggie, his wonderful gal, who was his secretary, said, you know, Paul wants to talk to you. And he said, hey, how's your leg? And I said, it's okay. And he said, how's the snow? And I said, it's good. He said, well, I wanted to come up and ski with you today. Is that okay? I said, Paul, oh, I'm going to cast. I can't ski. I said, but my wife and, you know, my father-in-law who owns a ski area, they'll be happy to ski with you. So I said, how long are you going to stay? He said, oh, just one day. I said, do you need a hotel or a condominium? He said, do you have room for me to stay with you? I went, you know, Paul, we just got a two-bedroom condominium. It's new, but you're welcome. Instead of staying one day, he stayed a week. <laughs> and, uh, so that's how our friendship began. And about day five, I cut off the cast and went skiing with him. <laughs> so we we had a ball. I mean, we uh, I had to actually dope him to get rid of him. I, I gave him a Placidil, which was a muscle relaxer and it just knock a horse down and to get rid of him uh because my ex-wife was having a fit about he and i you know skiing and then going down to bishop to ride motorcycles and then coming back up and having dinner and then going to play pool and setting a whirlpool until after midnight and so anyhow i had to come up with some kind of a thing to get rid of him. And Placido was the answer, <laughs> which was really, you know, I call my doctor, Wade Eckert, and I said, Wade, is this going to affect him with his drinking? And, you know, I had somewhat of a medical background in the military. And he said, no, but it will enhance it, but it's not going to kill him. Well, I was so worried. I mean, I let him down after dinner and uh, made sure he was in the bed. <laughs> and you know, I kept checking him all night long to make sure he was still breathing because I was thinking, oh, man, I can see the headlines. Stuntman, uh, Poison, uh, uh, Paul Newman. And so, anyhow, the next morning he wakes up and he goes, oh, my God. I haven't slept like this since I was a kid. I, I, I'm i calling the plane to come up and get me in. Um, I, I got to get a physical. <laughs> so, I mean, it was, you know, and I didn't tell him for probably 20 years uh, what I had done. And and he was Mario Andretti and uh, Michael and Chicken Ness and uh, Parnelli and some of the other race car drivers were at a dinner we were all at a dinner and paul was telling him you know about his experience with me and i said time out and i tried to tell him the truth and he wouldn't believe it you know uh, but i said i can't take credit for this so, you know i said i drugged him anyhow everybody else thought it was funny but paul never admitted to it so well that's funny. and how much older was he than you <sighs> Paul was 19 years, I think, older than I was. So were you guys like brothers or was he like a big brother? I mean, you know, like his daughter said, we we had a um, a bromance. Uh, I mean, it was like instantly, you know, we were best friends. And, um, you know, I couldn't believe it because, you know, Paul was the biggest star in the world. And, uh, you know. I mean, I never expected to uh, have him as my best friend. You know, Hal Needham was probably my best friend. And, you know, Bert had done so much for my career. 
but you know, I was never starstruck at all. I mean, I'd done films with John Wayne and so on, and John had been in my home and so on. But you know, I, I wasn't really trying to have a friendship with Paul, but it it just was kind of organic and happened. So you were the leading stuntman in Hollywood at the time. I was one of them. I mean, Hal Needham was the best, and I was his protege. And, uh, you know, and my success uh, was largely a part of uh, Hal Needham's uh, taking a liking to me and uh, all the things he did for me and, you know, the rocket car and so on. But, um, you know, I, I... I had a, uh, I entertained such a, um, a great uh, um, reputation because of the association with Hal and the stunts that I'd done with him. How did you meet Hal? I was in pre-med up in Oregon and I'd been in Hollywood, I mean, California, and I had met uh, Lee Marvin because I was teaching karate. Uh, uh, in Malibu, and uh, he said, you ought to become a stuntman, and I said, I'm not interested, and uh, so he's, I said, do they make a lot of money? He said, yeah, the good ones do, so he put me in contact with a guy, and um, he was his stuntman, and he said, all the stuntmen are golden glove guys and karate guys, so that ended that, right? which I never hired that guy when I became a big stunt man. <laughs> um, but anyhow, I go to Oregon to finish my pre-med and uh, I needed a job to my school job started. So I went for an interview and I didn't know what it was for. And um, I drove up there and from Roseburg where I was staying with my brother and I had a, a car bed at the time and, and just got out of the military, and I had a what year? What year was this? Nineteen sixty-four. Okay. And so, anyhow, uh, I went on this interview, and I looked, and there was a line about two blocks long. When I finally got there, and all the guys had beards and long hair, and here I'm, you know, I got a flat top. And so I said, "Forget this. I'm not waiting in line." You know, I waited in line enough in the military. So I go over to the Hotel Eugene, and I'm sitting at the lunch counter for breakfast. And one of the uh, guys comes in and he says, oh, hey, are you on the film? And I said, no. He said, I started you do. He said, yeah, I'm the lighting gaffer. And so uh, he asked me what I was doing, and I told him, and I said, you know, I don't fit the bill. He said, well, I'm an ex-Marine, too. So anyhow, then a, a young guy who was really handsome guy and his beautiful wife came in and he called him over and he said, uh, hey, Mary Lou and Ralph, uh, I want you to meet this guy. And so I met him and he kind of told the story and he was the head makeup on the movie Shenandoah with Jimmy Stewart. And so he said, come with me. And so next thing I know, I'm in front of Andy McLaughlin, the director, and this guy says, hey, this guy's got a great face and kind of looks like Newman. He said, what do you say he gets a part of the guard? Next thing I know, I'm on the film. And uh, I meet Hal Needham there. And, you know, uh, it was kind of crazy. Hal said, first time I met Stan, I looked into his eyes and I saw myself. And so anyhow, one thing led to another. And I'm back in Hollywood and um, pretty soon I'm doubling Burt Reynolds. And, you know, I come back from New York and having done some pretty uh, impressive stunts, I guess. And, you know, I was everybody wanted me to work with them. So anyhow, that was that story. So when you first started doing stunts, you had no formal training, right? Oh, Just... no. no, I I had no idea what I was doing. But Bert was a really good, uh, I mean, he could have been a really great stuntman. 
And, uh, you know, he loved the stunt guys and he was very athletic. And, you know, between the two of us, because I was pretty athletic, you know, I had a, I'd won the Golden Gloves and I had a couple of black belts in karate and, you know, was a pretty disciplined athlete. And, you know, we did some great stunts up there. And so uh, Bert was really a big part of my career. And then when I came back to Hollywood, of course, Hal Needham used me on everything. And, you know, all of a sudden, everybody wanted me to double. So I was just very, very fortunate. In... Do you do you consider yourself to be an alpha male? I don't even know what that is. Oh, uh, because when I, I see photographs of you when you're young, and you're like doing wheelies on your motorcycle and all this crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. It's, uh, it's, I guess an alpha male is like the leader of the pack. And now, no, I think Hal Needham was that. And I was just, um, one of his, uh, pro, I was his protege, actually. So, you know, I have to give Hal the credit for all that. But you, you were, when you were, doing these stunts they were very aggressive i mean it's we're talking uh, a very high level of athleticism uh with a lot of guts i would say well you know i never looked at things uh, i was never really afraid of anything because um you know people said you're really brave or this or that i said hey you have to be afraid to be uh brave and i said i'm really not afraid and uh you know i think that gave me a big leg up on a lot of things but you know hooper was a big film well on dan august i did a ton of stunts too but i mean i i how would always use me for the big stunts and um you know i think the big thing was i never wanted to disappoint hal and um you know to have his um praise and confidence was huge to me because he was the best and everybody knew he was the best and being his protege you know certain things were expected i guess so you were you were fearless basically you weren't afraid of anything um i was afraid to hurt somebody else but not myself that's unusual i think i don't know if it is or not you know i mean and nascar racing i wasn't afraid of anything as far as i was concerned but i said boy you know i just don't want to hurt anybody else or another driver and that was the, my biggest concern the rocket car was great because i'm the only one that's going to get dead so the well and i, I remember one time we were talking and you mentioned that you had broken some some crazy number of bones in your career do you remember what that number was no, I mean, I haven't broken that many bones doing stunts. My son has, Stanton, but, you know, I mean, I busted my back and, you know, I had some, um, my neck and stuff. But, I mean, you know, not a tremendous amount, but I did a good job on what I did. <laughs> and, you know, I tore up my knee and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, relatively speaking, I was unscathed except... You know, in my extracurricular activities, you know, my ego kind of got the best of me in certain things. And, you know, I got bitten. So, so with uh, Hal, Hal, of course, was uh, he came up with a project for the rocket car. Is that? Yeah, he had driven a, a similar car as a promotional deal for the Hal Needham doll. And so, I mean, Kitty O'Neill was supposed to go for the land speed record and then the sound barrier and anyhow uh the toy company came in and offered bill fredericks a lot more money and she was never going to be able to i mean when she drove it her hands would be yanked off the wheel because of the tremendous acceleration Sorry for this endeavor positive and negative g load Stan Barrett was tested on the centrifuge at the University of Southern California. This was five Gs, five times his own body weight, still capable of controlling the butterfly steering wheel, still capable of controlling the instrumentation 
that operates his fuel and safety systems. The, the unknown commodity here is what happens when he's under a heavy positive G-load, deploys his chutes, and takes a tremendous jolt of negative G-load, and perhaps blacks out. In the rocket car, he will be nearly in a prone position and more subject to the forces of G-loading. The pressures make it difficult to breathe. The doctors had said Stanley probably wouldn't function past four Gs. Finally, he withstood not only five, but six Gs. I mean, Kitty was an unbelievable um, athlete and stunt girl. I mean, she was deaf uh, from birth, but she became a champion diver. And, you know, I used her on Airport 77. And it was kind of fun because when all the commotion is going on, she could read my lips. And so, I mean, I, I was a big fan of hers. And, um, you know, I, she set a woman's land speed record, but she didn't get to go for the barrier or an ultimate speed record. You know, Hal came in and, and uh, he was really being pushed by CBS. Um, Hal, Hal um, got the opportunity to go for a land speed record and so on. And he had a, there was a lot of controversy here. Uh, somebody poured acid on his chutes and um, at 600 miles an hour, he tried to throw out his chutes and they were gone. So five and a half miles later, you know, he ran out of lake bed and and ended up in the desert. So that ended his um, quest for land speed record of going for the sound barrier. And, you know, he he vowed right then he would never get in that rocket car again. And so when he uh, became a very wealthy uh, director and producer from Smokey and the Bandit and Hooper, who I did most of the big stunts in, uh, he looked things over and uh, there were several offers from people to drive the car, but he, you know, he said in this book, my name kept rising to the top of the list. And so he asked me to drive it and I said, okay. And so that's how I became the driver of the Budweiser rocket. And you weren't scared at all with the, no. you know, my only fear was failure. And, but aside from, you know, I, I didn't care about the physical harm or anything like that. That was not even a question with me. And how many runs did you do? Uh, 18. So it was 18 that led up to the final. Yeah. Nine at Bonneville. And we went faster than anybody had done there. 138 miles an hour. And then we, you know, I kept breaking through the salt and the car was torquing so much that it popped the canopy open and nearly broke in half. And, but I kept, I kept, uh, the throttle down because I could see the uh, timing lights. And I knew that if I didn't make it, you know, Hal wouldn't get a million bucks and we were finished. So I did. And, but we couldn't, we couldn't uh, run again there. And Chuck Yeager was part of our project. And he said, the only place to do this is Edwards. And so he and my lifelong friend, who was a, um, a doctor, a flight surgeon, and a colonel, and really had General Connolly's ear. Both those guys together uh, got us on Edwards. Original conqueror of the sound barrier, retired General Chuck Yeager, the guy they said had the right stuff. Did this outfit have the right stuff to go to the barrier? Yeah, I think so. Uh, they got the thrust, and it's a damn well designed piece of equipment. Beautiful. I'd love to drive it. Back when we were working on the X-1 in 1947, uh, you know, things were pretty crude. That's a, a real keen car. How crude were they? Well, you know, it, the thing was we didn't know anything about the speed of sound or what it meant. We just knew we were in trouble uh, as airplanes started buffeting. And it, so it was a barrier, you know, unless we got through it, the airplanes were pretty well uh, limited. And 
our whole space program would never come back about had we not gotten to the speed of sound. Week at his old haunt in Tonopah, Nevada, I asked retired Air Force General Chuck Yeager if he was surprised at the outcome at Bonneville. No, really, because when, uh, as you start getting up into speeds above 600, and 600 miles an hour, things start getting light on the car, and, and any time you get a disturbance because of a rough surface, such as the Bonneville salt flats are, that sort of aggravates the situation, and, and uh, it, it can get to be pretty hairy, and, and I'm glad to see uh, Hal try to move this thing down to Rogers Dry Lake there at Edwards, because that's as smooth as glass, and it's a lot harder, and you won't get any breakthrough like you were getting up there or skipping. The nose stayed down, but the rear was flexing. Yeah, because, see, you got a canopy back there and uh, all of the uh, struts, and you're getting uh, a little lift out of that area of the car. And remember, we put strakes or canard surfaces on the nose and bent them down to give us 400 pounds download on them. And I think we're getting just a little bit of feedback from the surface of the salt. That's kicking that thing up in the air, and as it, as it begins to bounce, it aggravates the situation. When you were there, did you ever converse with the guys about that? Did you ever mention hey, it? Yeah, Hal and I discussed it a little bit, and uh, the breakthrough was, uh, worried me a little bit uh, because when one wheel breaks through, that kind of drags to the right and then center of force will cause the other one to dig in, and if it went divergent, then you got a problem. You've got an accident, and i tell you, the way they're running that thing, uh, you know, real careful and, and by the numbers and the way it should be, I hate this. Well, I'm glad to see him try to move to a smoother service. Oh, I didn't realize that, that it was Chuck Yeager who figured out Edwards for you. Well, Chuck Yeager, and, you know, I can't give enough credit to Grant McNaughton. General Connolly told me, you know, Grant was a really deciding factor because he talked about your um you know, commitment and um, the kind of person you were, and, and he thought you would be a great representative. So, I mean, General Connolly was amazing, and he had gone to General Slay, who was the head of uh, the training command, and, uh, you know, I mean, it went all the way to the top, and uh, anyhow, we got permission, and I couldn't believe it, you know, when I found myself at Edwards because I'd been in the Air Force and it was kind of funny because uh, I was in altitude chamber work and testing and so on. And one of my classmates, it was his last flight uh, in the altitude chamber that Grant and I went on after I broke the barrier to, in order to fly the F-15. So... It was, it, I loved it. I mean, it was a great experience and the Air Force added so much credibility and and uh, help to us in so many ways. Without their participation, I don't think we'd have done it. Well, it's it's ironic because uh, Chuck Yeager broke the speed of sound barrier at Edwards as well many years yeah. earlier. In October, 1947, at Murad Desert Test Center in California. History is made by this aircraft, the XS-1, and its pilot, Captain Charles E. Yeager. This airplane and this pilot are about to be the first ever to fly faster than the speed of sound in level flight. A B-29 will take the XS-1 aloft and launch her at an altitude of about 35,000 feet. The XS-1 is not a military aircraft, but a flying research laboratory designed to test the effects of supersonic flight upon airplanes. It is powered by four rocket engines. Its weight empty is less than 5,000 pounds, but it carries 8,000 pounds of fuel. B-29s have done a lot of memorable things, but none of them ever before had a mission quite like this one. And no airplane ever did what the XS-1 is about to do. Tracking the sound barrier in level flight will be more than a spectacular feat. It will also give the Air Force valuable knowledge of the resources of new propulsive systems. Captain Yeager gets aboard the XS-1 
It can't be a long flight he's going to have in the little aircraft. At full power, the flight can't last more than two and a half minutes. But it's going to be a fast one. are ready, too, to do the timing, the only possible method for timing aircraft at extremely high altitudes. There she goes, a big moment in a history-making flight. Now she's approaching the barrier. The speed of sound at 35,000 feet is 660 miles per hour. A really big moment. Through the sound barrier. The first time ever in level flight. For the first time, except in dive, a man has flown an airplane faster than the speed of sound. It earned Captain Yeager many honors. And the historic plane, the XS-1, earned the resting place in the Smithsonian Institution. Yeah, 1947, he did. So that's, uh, let's see, 29 years earlier. Something like that. But, you know, I mean, the biggest thing was that, to me, is just being at Edwards added so much to the project and gave me such a feeling of, uh, I, I don't know what, how to explain it, but, you know, being there with Chuck, and having Chuck be a part of things and, uh, and, you know, and all the astronauts, I mean, Tom Stafford, Mike Collins, you name it, you know, there were a lot of people behind me. So how could you fail? I mean, that's, you know, if you think about it, it, it was actually 32 years later because he was 47 and you were 79, 1979. So it was, that was 32 years later. That's amazing if you think about it that he did what he did in 47 and then 32 years later you do the same thing that he did in the air but you're on land and he's by your side yeah that was really significant i thought wow yeah. and uh t I, you mentioned that michael collins was there now michael collins of course was part of the apollo 11 mission and he was also a rolex guy as well tell us uh about him being there well, I mean, you know, he was one of many. And, uh, I mean, you had Pete Knight, who was the fastest man in the air, and Colonel Pete Knight, who was uh, in charge of our program. And, and uh, I mean, we had a multitude of people behind us. So, I mean, I respected Mike and I respected Tom Stafford, but no more than I did Knight and Colonel Grazier, who had flown into tornadoes and everything else, uh, testing different aircraft. But, you know, everybody there was equally as important to me. And just to put things into perspective, um, it's fascinating because I've seen photos uh, of the event where you see Michael Collins. And it's so funny because here's this guy who had, was part of the first team to go to the moon. And there he is, and he's like, he's walking around, and he's like inspecting the Budweiser rocket car, and he's just totally fascinated with what you were about to do. Uh, and, you know, those guys never saw any kind of uh, um, celebrity status. They were always in the background. And, you know, that was pretty amazing to me. And, you know, Mike and I... Uh, communicated after the rocket car and he was telling me it was the most exciting thing he had ever seen i said come on mike i mean you've gone 20 some thousand miles an hour he said yeah but i was at so many miles high and he said you know i was there man he said i could not believe you did that he said you know so many guys were in tears and i wondered why and they said that because they couldn't believe that you know i was doing what i was doing and it was impressive. That rocket car was really impressive. I mean, to go to 740 miles an hour in 16 seconds, 
Let's get with the program. Two, one, ignition. Incredible power, Chuck Yeager. Yeah, Ken, he's smoking long air at a pretty good rate. He's being exposed to about two and a quarter G's longitudinal acceleration. That means he's picking up somewhere between 55 and 60 miles per hour per second. After he goes through the traps here at the mile and a half mark, he comes off the power and purges and his drag chute comes out. And after he gets below 200 miles here, he starts applying the brakes and slows down. You know, he keeps chewing away at that old sound barrier. From zero to 600 and back in less than a minute. It seems like such a simple problem as you described it there, Chuck Yeager. It may seem that way, but it really isn't. There's an awful lot goes on behind the scenes, uh, Ken. Yeah, you know what's interesting is um, Rolex has a long history of wearers going back to Sir Malcolm Campbell, who was the original speed demon who, uh, just like yourself, set back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back, uh, world land speed records. On land, Speed King, Sir Malcolm Campbell and the famous Bluebird screaming along the sands at Daytona Beach. In his fastest run through a measured mile, Sir Malcolm averaged 276.8 miles an hour, nearly five miles an hour better than his previous record. 25 years ago, such speed reached the limits of technology. And Sir Malcolm was literally a fraction of an inch from death. The thickness of the bare fabric on his tires as the Bluebird ended its run. And he was, I think he got up to, was it 320 miles an hour or something like that? It is. First man over 300 miles an hour. But, you know, there were guys that lost their lives like Seagrave and other people. Um equally as important as he was. I mean, he and Donald, you know, Donald ended up uh, losing his life uh, going for the water speed record. In fact, I was chosen to induct him into the Motor Sports Hall of Fame and, with his sister. And, uh, you know, I respect all those people. Everybody who, you know, went for, you know, the edge, so to speak, and wanted to extend uh, the boundaries. How many, how many successive records did you break back to back with the record? I have no idea. I never, you know, I didn't care. I mean, I just, uh, I was just interested in the sound beer. I could have cared less about anything else. But I, I, my recollection is it was something like six or something like that, where you, cause you just kept, correct me if I'm wrong, but you kept driving it faster and faster and faster. And faster. I mean, if you look at that, you know, from Bonneville on, I, I don't know, I'd have to sit down and look at the charts and so on, but it was probably that or more. Yeah, it was, exactly. But, I mean, records are only made to be broken. You know, to be the first to do something is what really counts. So I didn't care about records. So I, I, I'm just trying to draw the analogy that you had a lot in common with Sir Malcolm Campbell in that you just, the one thing you guys had in common is you both just kept breaking barriers, breaking barriers, breaking barriers. You kept pushing the envelope of what was believed to be possible. And what's crazy is you were going more than twice as fast as Sir Malcolm Campbell ever went. Yeah. I mean, that's, and it's, that, yeah. It, it's mind boggling to me to, to this day when I see the footage, uh, which I've studied so carefully, it just, it takes my breath away what you did, what you what you men did. Well, you know, when I look at it, um, I'm not overly impressed with it. You know, I it's like a stunt to me. You know, I just went on from one to another. And, uh, you know, the rocket car was opened the doors for a lot of things that were important to me, like my mission work and Christianity and so on. So that was the only thing I cared about. And uh, I've never been one to dwell on the past. You know, uh, your future is your past. So that's what I looked at. And, you know, I just did the best I could. And, you know, there's a script that says, do everything as you're doing it under the Lord. And that was my motto from the time I was a kid. When I washed my dad's car, when I shined shoes, when I mowed the lawn, you know, that was the same thing I thought about. 
And, you know, when I met Hal Needham, he was such an achiever. And, uh, I mean, he was a tremendous example. And, uh, you know, I can't give him enough credit. And, you know, other people in my life were like James Best, who I met on Shenandoah. And it was kind of funny that Jimmy Stewart was Grant McNaughton, my best friend in service, his godfather. And so Jimmy and I became friends. And I mean, it was crazy. I mean, it was ordained to happen. And, um, you know, I've often said I was like being in a canoe down a river and I had no um, oar. I just, it, the current would take me where it wanted to. So I've just been f- so fortunate. And sometimes I just wonder, uh, why me? <laughs> you know, uh, why was I picked to do certain things or be at a certain place at a certain time? So I'm just really grateful for my uh, my career or my past or whatever you want to say. Or, you know, meeting people like Billy Graham and Franklin and, you know, people at Slavic Gospel and so on. I mean, it just seemed like everything fell into uh, line. I think I heard you mention something about a million dollar purse with the rocket car. Is that? I mean, that was for Hal. I mean, I got, you know, I probably made 150,000 off of it or something like that. And, you know, really depended on endorsements and stuff, which I wouldn't do a lot. You know, I was not a very good uh, representative because I didn't really care about being famous or, I could have made a lot of money on this speaking tour, but, you know, I don't like to talk about what I did. So who put up the million dollars? Ha- uh, Budweiser. But Hal Needham put it up uh, first. I mean, he had to finance it. And then as he met certain uh, goals, he got a certain amount of money. <laughs> Earlier, Hal Needham took a few moments to give us an example of how much power this rocket car has. These drums contained hydrogen peroxide. That's a fuel. It's a fuel that Stanley Baird is going to use in this rocket car. It holds 138 gallons. That is about 1,500 pounds. It develops 48,000 horsepower. Now, let's see, 48,000 horsepower. Let me break that down a little bit. Your average car has... 210 horsepower. An average Indianapolis car has 850 horsepower. There are 33 Indianapolis cars on the grid. In order to equal the power in this rocket car, it would take twice that amount. Ken, Hal was talking about the maximum amount of thrust he's getting in this thing. Let me explain it real quick, what this hybrid chamber does on that rocket motor. The hydrogen peroxide comes through that catalyst crystal, decomposes, and expands about a thousand times into steam. And that steam temperature is almost up to 1,200 degrees. Now we come back into this hybrid chamber that's behind the hydrogen peroxide rocket. Mm-hmm. Now that gas, which is about 1,200 degrees, comes into that chamber and it decomposes this poly composition. And uh, when that 1,200 degree gas hits this poly, it decomposes it from solid to gas instantly. And increases that chamber pressure in the hybrid chamber oh, about 50% more, giving, giving us about 50% more thrust. Now, in addition to that, we got that sidewinder setting up there, and that sidewinder puts out roughly 4,000 pounds of thrust for about six seconds. They change a little bit, vary between motors, but that's about what you get. And how did Budweiser come up with this idea to... Well, they didn't come up with it. I mean... Paul Newman asked me to come back to St. Louis uh, because he was racing a race back there. And I knew the track pretty well because I was from St. Louis and I had done a lot there. And uh, so I came back there with actually with James Best, who had done a film with Paul. But Jimmy was really a close friend that I met on Shenandoah. But anyhow, long story short, I went back there and... Paul was with Budweiser in their uh, uh, camper, and I came in, and of course, Paul would always sing my praises, and he said, you guys ought to really get involved with what Stan's doing, and they said, what's that? And he said, breaking the sound barrier in a rocket car, and so next thing you know, uh, there's a meeting set up, and I call Hal, and we come back to St. Louis, and we sign a deal. 
but Paul was really, if Paul hadn't done it because Coca-Cola was talking to us and different people, but Budweiser seemed like a, a natural uh, for this because of the boat they had and so on, Miss Budweiser. Now, you mentioned you were born in St. Louis. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And you grew up there. Yep. And I guess I don't think I've grown up yet. Tell tell us about your childhood. Well, you know, we my childhood was really one of change. I mean, I went to like 17 different schools and we moved 26 times before I was a freshman in high school. And um, so there was a lot of change and so on in my life. But, you know. Uh, Why so many times? I don't know. My, you'd have to ask my dad, and he's gone. Um, but, I mean, from Arkansas, all over St. Louis, to Hannibal, Missouri, to, you know, we just moved a lot. Dad had so many irons in the fire. Was he an entrepreneur, or? Uh, he was a actually was a railroad engineer, which kind of sustained him, but he was an inventor. He, you know, the stretch of weight exercisers he had a patent on that and some other things and uh dad was really a visionary but anyhow then he ended up as a chiropractor and marriage counselor and so on but dad was always there was always changed so i was uh you know i think it did me a lot of good because i had to adjust to every school that i went to and you know i had to fight my way into certain things and out of certain things. And that's probably why I became a boxer. I, I had a similar uh, upbringing where I went to 12 schools in 12 years before college as well. So I always <laughs> a lot. Of, yeah, you have to yeah. adapt. It causes you to have to adapt. So were you close with your father? Uh, not really. I mean, dad was never home. He was always, he had two or three jobs or two or three things going at a time. And, and, you know, he would like when he went to chiropractor college, he, he was studying while his fireman's running the train and he would get some sleep. Uh, but dad was just amazing guy. He was super smart. And, uh, the reason he became a chiropractor was he had, had a train accident and was in the hospital for like 16 weeks and um, paralyzed a certain amount. And a chiropractor adjusted him a couple of times and dad was uh, back on the, on the scene. And so he decided, because uh, he was going to go on and be a doctor and he decided to go to chiropractor college. Wow. So, and how about your relationship with your mom? Were you close with your mom? Uh, my mom was difficult. She was one of 12 or 13 kids, and she was just, uh, she was difficult until later in life, and she had a thyroidectomy and some other things, and she changed. And in fact, the first money I made from Green Berets with John Wayne, um, I was supposed to be down there a week, and I stayed 10 weeks, and uh, the money I had, I took and bought her a floor shop because my dad had divorced her and I gave her, she was really creative and I gave her the opportunity to put that to, to work. And she became pretty famous in uh, St. Louis. I mean, when they do interviews with me for the rocket car and so on, I'd say, Hey, by the way, uh, go out to Barrett's floor boutique and say hello to my mom. And they said, how can we recognize your mom? This is, a guy that was so popular in the Midwest, uh, uh, his radio program. And I said, well, she's the gal in the bonnet and the sackcloth uh, dress uh, in the corner, chewing tobacco and spitting in petunias. And I mean, this kind of stuff went all over the place. You know, um, Jack Carney show. So I did it so many times. I was supposed to go on it. Budweiser had me go on it for 15 minutes and stayed four hours. And so Jack and I became great friends, and I did the show a lot. Did, did you have a brother? I've got two brothers, my older brother, Jerry, and then I've got a younger brother, Preston. So you were the middle brother. Yeah. Obviously. 
And so, uh, was your older brother, was he always like beating you up and stuff or? Yeah, for a long time until I got, you know, 13 or 14 and then the tables were turned. <laughs> and then you started whooping him all the time? No, I just defended myself. So anyhow. And then you got, was... you got into boxing. Uh, how did that happen? Who knows? You know, I, I, uh. My dad had fought at Sherman Park in St. Louis, and we had a gift shop and a hospital there. And so I was always reading a ring magazine because I was, you know, I was named after a boxer, Stanley Ketchel. And, uh, you know, he was the hardest hitting middleweight ever. He knocked down Jack Johnson, the heavyweight champion, then he got thumped pretty good. But anyhow, uh, I... One of the orderlies came in and said, oh, you, you like boxing? I said, yeah. He said, well, my brother's a Golden Glove champion. I said, oh, wow. He said, you want to meet him? And I said, sure. And next thing you know, I meet him and he invites me to go down to Sherman Park where my dad had boxed. And next thing you know, I'm in the ring fighting for a championship. So your father was a prize fighter? No, he was a boxer, you know. Um uh, he didn't turn pro. He was just an amateur boxer. Because my grandfather, Jake, uh, put himself through law school and took care of his family being a prize fighter in San Francisco. Wow, and, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and he was friends with Jack Dempsey later. Um, but the way it worked was they would have these prize fights, I think, in San Francisco every Friday night or something like that. And they would stick two men in the ring together and the person who won got the prize and the person who lost got nothing. Um, and that was a, a tough life. And that was when they had those really skinny gloves. Yeah. Yeah. They had eight or 10 ounce gloves, which, you know, we fought with 10 ounce gloves and the, and the gloves back then, but now they're probably 14 or 16 ounce gloves and headgear. We had no headgear. Yeah, that was no messing around back then. Wow, that's amazing. And uh, and you won the Golden Gloves? Yeah. You mentioned twice, was it? No, just once. Just once? You know, I, I boxed in the service and won a lot of things. But And I was going to the Pan American Games and then the Olympics if I did good in the Pan. But I, I was undefeated. And, you know, I just had kind of a, um, I had a real religious conviction uh, happened to me in um, Ridgecrest, North Carolina, right next to Billy Graham's home in Black Mountain. And, um, you know, I, I had intended to go to the Olympics and then turn pro. And, uh, but, you know, I had this, um, I don't know what you call it, but anyhow, um, I decided to quit boxing and become a medical missionary. And so, that's why I went to Oregon after I got out to try to do my pre-med. Oh, okay. That makes sense all of a sudden. And then uh, how did you get into karate? Oh, in the military, I was just impressed with, I'd work out every night at the gym. And there was a couple of guys that were doing karate. And I went, wow, that's pretty interesting. And so next thing you know, I'm studying and you know, got my black belt in one or second degree black belt after a while in one style. And then I got a black belt also in another style called Mudukwan Tang Sudo, which was a hard fist technique that I didn't really like that much, but it had some, it had some points with it. So you were like a pretty tough guy. I could say, um, I was capable and uh, but nobody really challenged me, um, and I was glad of that. I, I think one of the reasons probably I did that is because I didn't want to get beat up, and you know I developed such a reputation that I couldn't even believe it. Uh, you know I would hear stories about me going in and beating up these guys or that guys when I was in high school. I, don't, I was never there, you know. But after the gloves, my reputation spread pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, because you've always struck me as being very genteel, like, you know, quite the gentle man. Yeah, there's another side of me if I'm <laughs> provoked, but that doesn't come out very often. 
So lur lurking underneath uh, the genteel exterior is a caveman. Well, there's somebody that, uh, uh, you know, has a code of ethics and I don't violate somebody else's and I don't want them to violate mine. And you mentioned um, your religion, uh, your religious beliefs. Uh, and did you say you had a, a, a seminal event when you were younger? Tell us about it. Yeah, my dad was a chaplain of a hospital as well. And I was raised in a Christian family. And shoot, we'd go to church three times a week or four times. And, uh, you know, so I was brought up in a, in a Southern Baptist kind of a family. And, you know, um, I think when I got into service, uh, you know, I was just really centered on my boxing career and let everything else kind of fall aside until I went down to that. There was a, um, they called it spiritual week for the Air Force, and you got nine days TDY. And so I went, whoa, nine days off? I'm going. Sign me up. And so I had a new Corvette. And so away I went down to Ridgecrest, and that's where things started happening in my life. Because we, I'd gone there with my dad when I was a kid to a, a camp at Ridgecrest probably two or three times. So when I found that out, man, I was all in it. And what what was this uh, experience you had that? Well, I just, uh, you know, I just, it was kind of funny because Cliff Barrels, all I was down there for was the girls and and having fun and Cliff Barrels, we had the last night there, and I had not attended one service. And Cliff Barrels, who was Billy Graham's uh, lead singer for many years, he was invited over there, and he sang two songs. One of them was uh, How Great Thou Art, and another one was, uh, uh, what was the name of that, uh, In the Garden. And it touched me in such a way I couldn't explain it. And so after the service, they had a deal where we put a thumbtack through a candle and lit it, and they put it out in this lake, and how one person can affect so many lives. And so that was that was it for me. Interesting. Also, I remember um, you. we were talking about Steve McQueen. How did you meet Steve McQueen? Uh, let's see. I had known Steve. Uh, from racing motorcycles and practicing out at Indian Dunes, but I, I didn't have much to do. We were both in the viewfinders uh, motorcycle group, but you know I was a lot better rider than Steve was at the time. But I mean, he was good. You know, he he rode in the six day trials and so on. But um, I got a call um, to go down and double him on Papillon, and the guy that was doing the show was Joe Canut, whose father, um, Yakima Canut, was kind of the, um, you know, the the guy that really popularized stuntmen. And uh, so he called me and he had known of the stunts I had done and so on and worked with me. And he said, you know, I want you to double Steve McQueen. So I went down on Papi and and doubled him. And uh, I ended up quitting the show because they, I was the highest paid guy at the time. And they had to put me on two contracts to get me down there to make my money. And so I got a call and I came in and they said, hey, we want to talk to you about money. I said, you're going to pay me more? And they said, no, we're going to put you on an actor's contract until you do some stunts. And then we'll put you on a stunt contract. And I said, get my ticket. I'm going home. And I went, what? And I said, why should I stay down here away from my family and make half the money I can make at home? And so I walk out of there and a guy named Don Gordon, who was uh, Steve's, one of his best friends, said, what's going on? And I told him, and he said, oh, I hope they're not going to do that to me. And I said, well, we'll see, huh? So he goes and tells Steve. And so I'm out in the kind of the yard that we were uh, filming in. And Steve comes up and says, hey, man, what's this I hear about you quitting? And I said, yeah, they're trying to mess with me with my money. And he said, well, I'll, I'll make it up to you. 
I'll pay for it. And I said, no, that's not the deal, man. I said, it's a matter of principle to me. And he said, no, please let me, I'll pay the extra. And I said, no. And so then we started talking about uh, a friend of ours who was a great desert racer, Jay Ann Roberts. And he said, Jay Ann's kind of gone off the deep end. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, with his religion. And I said, hey, Jay Ann was involved in a lot of drugs and nonsense. And, you know, he's uh, accepted Christ and he's really changed. And so Steve goes, well, you know, uh, I've gone to church. And if you look at the Steve McQueen American icon, there's a thing that I did with uh, uh, Mel Gibson. And I said to him, I said, because you're going in and out of a, a barn doesn't mean you're a cow. I said, are you Christian? And so that started uh, Steve's kind of pilgrimage in a way. But anyhow, so that's how I doubled. And I was supposed to double he and Paul on Tarring Inferno, but I had my kneecap removed and I couldn't do it. Oh, okay. Um, so next, let's let's talk about that really now iconic photo of you in front of the Budweiser car where you're wearing your Daytona and your GMT Master and you're polishing your goggles. Okay. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, I mean, those watches meant a lot to me because Paul gave them to me. And, you know, Paul was the one that got me involved in racing and a lot of other things. And, you know, it was just, he was my, aside from Hal, was my closest friend. And so I just wanted a part of him to be with me in, in the rocket car, you know. Mm -hmm. He came to Bonneville, and then it scared him so bad that last run that he said, I, I can't come to Edwards. He said, I, I don't want to see you die because everybody thought I was going to get killed there. So, but I mean, Paul was such a great friend. And um, I mean, he was so uh, generous with me. And well, like Jimmy, the guy he gave the watch that went for 17, 18 million dollars. I mean, Jimmy was just kind of dating Nell and working on a tree house. <laughs> kind of guy Paul was, you know, I've got a brightly he gave me that he went up and got me, brought it back down. He said, hey, uh, don't wear this in front of uh, Bruce Willis because I think he gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, we had a great relationship and, you know, I was with him up until a week before he passed away and it was really difficult for me. So he gave you the Daytona as a good luck charm for your race at, I mean, for you. I don't know what he gave it to me for. I mean, he just gave it to me. And, you know, like the GMT Master, I had bought my father-in-law one and uh, he lost it or something. And so I gave him the one off my wrist. And so Paul said, what happened to your, your watch? And I said, well, I gave it to my father-in-law. And like three days later, another one arrives because he had a, such a relationship with Rolex. And, uh, you know, I don't I don't know what to say about all that. I mean, I don't know whether he gave me that Daytona in 75, uh, 74 or 75 or perhaps 76. We had driven back. And went to his house. I mean, my ex-wife would probably know. And uh, he presented me with that watch. And he said, hey, that keep great time, but it's it's cool looking watch. <laughs> I said, okay. But, you know, at Daytona, I mean, at Bonneville, he said to me, we're at lunch one day. And I, I got pictures of that. And he goes, hey, take care of my watches, will you? And or something to that order. And I said, okay, you know, which was his way of saying, hey, man, just be safe. And uh, anyhow, uh, so what I what, what, so much. What was it about Rolex that appealed to you guys? I, you know, as a stunt man, a GMT master was kind of a sign of you've arrived or success. I mean, Hal had one, Ronnie Rondell had one. And they were to the best. And so I thought, hey, you know, I need one of these. 
And was so, it what was the the uh Hal Needham movie with Burt Reynolds where in the opening credits when they were rolling, he takes off his date Hooper. Hooper, right. He yeah. takes off his day date and puts on the GMT master. Yeah. And was that Hooper- was GMT master. I, um, I think I, I don't remember. We changed, you know, Bert would always want to watch, uh, wear one of my watches and certain things, but he was not a Rolex kind of guy. He had some other, you know, kind of strange looking watch all the time, but, Anyhow, he late he later became a Rolex guy though. You know, I don't know if he did or not. Yeah, I don't he, remember. Yeah, he did because uh, I did a story on him when he was older, and he always he had a, I think a really unusual gold Rolex with a a bracelet on it that didn't look like a Rolex bracelet. So if you didn't know any better, you wouldn't necessarily think it was a Rolex. I think Hal Needham probably got him that. I mean. A couple of guys and myself went together and bought Hal a gold Rolex. And, um, you know, at the time it was like 1200 bucks. And uh, he gave it to him. And then he, <laughs> it was really funny because Hal was quite the player. And uh, he got drugged by some prostitute, I guess. And he lost that watch and uh, got him another one. And he lost that because I asked him, I said, what happened to this watch? And he did the same thing. I went, oh, man. <laughs> That's funny. So um, so how did you meet Burt Reynolds? I met Burt Reynolds through uh, James Best. Um, you know, Jimmy and I were friends from Shenandoah, and I was staying in his guest house and teaching karate in his um, actor's uh, studio because he wanted me to be an actor, and Jimmy Stewart did and so on. But, you know, I didn't like, I, I wanted to be a, st- if I was going to do anything, I I don't think I even thought about being a stuntman until uh, Hal called me and said, hey, what are you doing? I said, you know, just trying to get things together to finish my schooling. And he said, are you happy? And I said, not really. And he goes, well, you want to go to New York? I said, with you? He's he said, no, with Bert. I said, what am I going to do in New York? Am I going to be his bodyguard? And he said, no, you're going to be a stuntman. And that's how I got into stunts. So, so anyhow. How did, what led him to assume you'd want to be a stuntman? He just thought, you know, like I say, when he said, you know, looking at and one uh, interview, he said, when I looked in Stan's eyes, I saw myself. And I was teaching his kids boxing and karate. And I think he was just impressed with my ability. And and he just thought I'd be a great stuntman. He, just he had... said, if you can hurt, you'll be the best. And so I broke my back that first day. Uh, but, I mean, it didn't stop me. Anyhow. Uh, but I went to New York. <sighs> with a busted back and a big swollen hip. and um, But, you know, Bert and I did some pretty good stunts. And when I came back to California, I was, everybody wanted me. What was he, what was he like in person when you guys were just hanging out off camera? Who, Bert? Yes. You know, Bert was really a, a great guy to me. He was always really respectful and, uh, he was very, very, he was cheap with a lot of people, but he was not with me. And, um, you know, we lived together for a while. And uh, it was funny because I got some really great dates because he would stand up these girls and they would call and he'd say, um, where's Bert? <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> what, um, well, we had a date tonight. And I said, well, I'm sorry. And they'd say, what are you doing? <laughs> I say, well, nothing. <laughs> so I got, I got uh, probably three or four really great dates out of that deal. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> yeah, it was. I went, wow. You know, I said, Bert, what are you doing? He said, well, I had another gal, and I, I was driving down Sunset, and uh, kind of like McQueen, you know, they pick up these girls so often, you know. Yeah, they're both uh, hardcore ladies, men. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's so funny. 
So tell us about your uh, son, Stanton, and his career as a stuntman. Did he, he just followed in your footsteps? Yeah, both Stanton and David. You know, Stanton, uh, Stanton was always kind of the uh, behind the scenes kind of guy. David was such a um, vivacious, uh, outgoing guy and was kind of the apple of the McCoy's eye. And Stanton was, um, you know, he was just, uh, he was quiet. And uh, like, you know, David was a great skier. Well, Stanton, uh, he would go into the woods and ski by himself in the snow. And he became an unbelievable skier. When he came out of there, he was on fire. And, uh, you know, in the divorce, Stanton stayed with me rather than to be with his grandparents in Mammoth Mountain, as David did, and my my daughter. So Stanton really sacrificed everything just to be with his dad. And, uh, you know, we had a, <laughs> such a great relationship and so many times together that, um, you know, and he bought the house next door to me, so that says a lot. And so he, he uh, has a long career as a stuntman as well. Yeah, he's so underspoken but i mean there's nobody better in cars and some of the other things anything he does he does he's amazing but he will never brag or try to be the center of attention in anything and he's also has, has a racing career as well right yeah and nascar and so on you know he raced four indy car races and some nascar races but he's never really had the backing that he needs you know to buy a good ride so, you know, perhaps in the future we'll be able to buy him a great ride. So he's still racing? Yeah. He's racing different things and you know, he's he's got a career. He's a great stunt man and he's directing. He directed one picture and he's getting ready to um hopefully direct a picture that I wrote for um actually Denzel Washington may do it and Stan will direct it hopefully. But regardless, he'll he'll be directing. So he basically followed in your footsteps. Yeah, you know, both kids did. You know, David became a stuntman, then a second unit director, which I uh, helped him with. And then the first two shows he directed, I kind of was there and helped him direct. And then he took off and, you know, he did uh, uh crime story for eight years and is a producer director. And he's going from one thing to another right now. So is he, uh, and that show concluded, right? Yeah. No, it's, I think it's still going. He quit it. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's amazing to have. So both of your sons followed in your footsteps. I'm afraid so. That's amazing. Uh, so with Paul, you guys were super, like super best friends. And when I look at the photographs of you guys, it's like you were kind of, you were what he wanted to be and he admired you because you were always, you know, doing all this crazy stuff. And then you seem to have admired him because he was such an amazing actor. And well, you I don't know that, you know, he admired me because I was honest and uh, I had integrity and, you know, he wasn't around a lot of people with integrity and, uh, you know, I would tell Paul the truth about things and, you know, he could always count on me and, uh, you know, I never tried to use him, but I did respect him as an actor and so on. I mean, we used to go over his lines at night when we always had a place together on location and it was real fun to, you know, go over his lines and then he'd go, what did you say? And I said, Paul, it's dialogue. He said, I got to make an actor out of you. And I said, no, I don't want to be an actor. And uh, but we had such fun together. And, uh, you know, it, it was just a, I was so blessed to have a relationship like that. And I never thought of him, although I respected him as an actor, I never thought of him as a uh, the huge star that he was. So anyway, it was kind of fun. And you, 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 know, you guys looked a lot alike. I mean, you I don't know if we looked so much alike. I mean, maybe I had, you know kind of blue eyes and stuff but i mean maybe a little bit but i mean the power of suggestion is a big thing you know i would never compare myself to paul newman because he was <laughs> he was the best looking guy on the planet 
our relationship was unusual. And, you know, I was his best friend and his confidant. I mean, he always knew, you know, he could trust me. And, um, I mean, he tried to give me so many things and I wouldn't take them. Like, he came down to the log cabin, which I was building in North Carolina. And I have a picture of him. And uh, I think I was with, uh, oh, what was it? she was a big star. And Stanton and, and another person. And um, uh, Daryl Hannah, I was with. And anyhow, long story short is, he said, how are you doing on this place? And I said, oh, good. He said, well, how are you doing financially? I said, well, I'm going to go to the bank tomorrow and borrow some more money. But I said, you know, I'll, uh, it'll all come out when I get my final loan. So two days later, a check for, he said, how much are you going to get? And I said, I'll probably get 70 or so thousand. A check arrives in the mail for 80 grand. Wow. And I go, so I call Paul because it's from his business manager. I said, Paul, what are you doing? He said, hey, it's a gift. Just enjoy it. And I said, I can't do that, Paul. I said, I will pay you back with interest when I get the, con- you know, after the construction loan. He said, well, you don't have to do that. And, but, you know, same way with the the Volvo wagon I got from him. He said, just take it. And I said, no, I can't do that, Paul. And he said, why not? And I said, hey, I don't want to ever have anybody say that, you know, I took something from you uh, or you took advantage of our friendship. And so I I called the, he said, well, call uh, Brockman, who was, uh, had the Volvo agency with him. And he said, see what it's on the books for. And so I did. And it was on the books for like, I asked Brockman, he said, well, we're going to sell it. And started on eBay at a hundred thousand dollars, and I said, "Whoa!" So when I came back, and Paul said, "Well, did you call him?" I said, "Yeah, but Paul, I can't afford a hundred thousand dollars." He said, "Just take it; it's yours." I said, "No." So I found out what it was on the books for, which was twenty six thousand or something, and I wrote him a check for it. So I was always concerned about not taking advantage of our friendship. It's so- he tried to buy the house next door. So I'd be close to him back there. Oh, it's so interesting when I see all the photos of you guys together because he's a man that everybody was always in hot pursuit of. The ladies loved him, the guys loved him. He was a he was a man's man and a lady's man. And it's funny because he's always like hugging you and has his arm around you, and it's uh, he he really adored you. And I guess. Uh, You were basically like his best friend. Uh, No question about that. Stan Barrett roars toward the mile marker. Hits the sidewinder. Heading for the two-mile marker. We have seen this vehicle make some 18 runs, but none so flawless as this. The reaction of 37-year-old Bishop California, Stan Barrett. One word for it. Wow. Slowing down in the four-mile area. Talk about whipping, rolling resistance. What a phenomenal run for car builder Bill Frederick. And right here, car owner Hal Needham going down to the six-mile marker where the car has come to rest. There you see the crew picking up the chute. Stan Barrett still in the machine here at Rogers Dry Lake Edwards Air Force Base. It looks like history has been made. We're waiting for the story. Let's look again and replay. From Air Force radar, watch as 12,000 additional horsepower, 6,000 additional pounds of thrust is triggered by Stanley Barrett with that sidewinder. 60,000 horsepower working for 731.9 miles per hour. 
Did he make it? Hal Needham on the right, Bill Fredericks on the left, assisting Stan Barrett out of the car. I'm going to announce what we got so far. We don't have Flanders speed. We ran out of fuel between two and 400 feet before the lights. We got 734 on radar, 739 on airspeed. We probably broke the speed. Of... The dream of Bill Frederick and Hal Needham for years is attained by driver Stan Barrett and a special salute from one mock buster to another. Hours later, I asked the man who first broke the sound barrier in 1947, General Chuck Yeager, what does all this mean? I'll tell you what it means, Ken. We've got a stack of data that high that we'll be using for years on this thing going supersonic on the deck. And another thing is, a guy like Bill Fredericks, his dream, he builds this car in his own backyard, financed by a private citizen. We bring it up here at Rogers Dry Lake at Edwards Air Force Base and drive it. And there ain't nowhere else in the world that something like that can take place except here in the good old USA.